Hi, I'm Heather Lau. I'm the director of the Lysosomal Storage Disorders Program here at NYU School of Medicine. I'm also a board certified neurologist with special qualifications in child neurology, as well as the associate director of the Division of Neurogenetics in the Department of Neurology. So the MPS group of disorders, which stands for mucopolysaccharidoses, are a rare group of disorders that are categorized under the uh, larger umbrella term lysosomal storage disorders. The lysosome is an organelle um, within the cell that houses many different enzymes. And those enzymes are integral in the breakdown of a variety of uh, molecules. In the case of the MPS disorders, the mucopolysaccharidoses, there are several uh, enzyme deficiencies that, um, are, that lead to the accumulation of the substrate glycosaminoglycans. So the MPS disorders um, each lead to the accumulation of the GAGs these glycosaminoglycans then fill up the cell and cause uh, lysosomal dysfunction and cellular dysfunction. These cells then go on to deposit throughout the body, leading to multisystemic dysfunction. Um, so the NPS disorders um, have been historically numbered one through seven, and in retrospect, number five was actually recategorized as a different disorder. Today we'll go over a little bit about the uh, compare and contrast the different types of mucopolysaccharidoses. And um, we'll start off with that as a group, they all lead um, to a range of manifestations. They can, uh, the systemic manifestations uh, include cardiac, pulmonary, bone, cartilage, as well as in certain cases, uh, neurologic dysfunction. The uh, the typical presentation can uh, occur anywhere from the neonatal period through later in childhood. In certain MPSs, they're more historically uh, after a period of normal development. If we look at MPS1, also known as Hurler, hurler shea or Shea syndrome, originally these, thought, the, these were thought to be three separate disorders because they differed in whether or not there was cognitive dysfunction. However, they all shared similar features. They developed corneal clouding, they had um, effects on cardiac dysfunction, pulmonary function, and um, had a sp specific uh, skeletal manifestation called dysostosis multiplex. However, the more severe form of it called Hurler had uh, a regression of developmental milestones within the first few years of life. And these children would go on to become uh, ranging uh, uh, intellectual disability ranging from mild to, to severe. The, the intermediate phenotype called hurler shea had um, some impact on cognition, whereas Shea was completely without cognitive impairment. But after the um, enzyme was isolated uh, in this case, uh, alpha l um was found to be deficient in all three states. So this actually um, is called MPS1. And so now we know that MPS1 is a spectrum of disease. And this actually happens again in also in MPS2 and MPS7. MPS2 is Hunter syndrome. And in the severe uh, form of Hunter syndrome, we have developmental regression going on to uh, uh, varying degrees of developmental delay, impact on cognition, hyperactivity, and other behavioral disorders. Uh, but then there's the, quote, attenuated form of hunters where there's normal cognition and people can go on to achieve high school, college, and beyond. Um, however, uh, despite the difference in the cognitive abilities in both MPS1 and MPS2, the disease burden, the multisystemic disease burden is still quite great. And I'm actually working on a retrospective review of the disease burden. I presented that abstract at World last year, showing that within the first few years of life, both the attenuated form of hunters and the more severe form have the uh, other multisystemic features uh, equally. So the term attenuated might be a misnomer or misleading. Uh, it is still a severe disease in both forms. So for instance, children will present with recurrent ear infections, um, requiring myringotomy tubes at some times. Their oral airway and their upper airway 
are uh, narrowed uh, due to gag deposition, causing soft tissue, swelling. They are a difficult airway for um, procedures and sedation. They can all go on to have varying degrees of uh, valvular dysfunction uh, due to the gag deposition. Pulmonary function and also sleep can be disrupted in both MPS1 and MPS2 in both the severe form and the milder, the quote, the cognitively intact forms. Um, so this highlights that uh, there is some unknown reason why there's a neuronopathic form versus a non-neuronopathic form, but regardless, the multisystemic disorder, it is in both forms. Uh, f in MPS7, that also ranges. Uh, it's called S Sly syndrome. Uh, Sly syndrome is ultra rare disorder out of all of them, uh, so even more obscure. And that is also a spectrum of disease ranging from the severe form at birth with non-immune high drops fatalis, which is characterized, could be even in utero, um, a, a fluid overload in the infant or the fetus, as well as anasarca, uh, leading to, um, can be lethal in utero and in the first few months of life. Uh, ranging all the way to normal cognition uh, with maybe some just restriction of growth. So Sly syndrome is another one of the MPSs where we see a spectrum of disease. And again, we can't really determine necessarily at birth if there's going to be cognitive impairment or not, and they need to be closely followed. Um, so the MPS-7, fortunately, uh, there is a development of an enzyme replacement therapy for a recombinant form of the, the beta-glucuronidase. Uh, it's now called MEPSEVI. And that is an enzyme replacement therapy that's given every two weeks intravenously over about four hours. And it has shown um, significant uh, decrease in the accumulation of the glycosaminoglycans excreted in the urine. And it's also improved uh, walking and uh, hopefully over the long term as we see, uh, as we follow these patients forward, that we'll see impacts on pulmonary and cardiac function as well. For, for MPS1 um, and uh, MPS2, there are also enzyme replacement therapies. Again, recombinant, recombinant forms of the enzyme that they're missing. These are given actually weekly, uh, intravenously. Um, so all three of these enzymes, MPS1, 2, and 7, um, are FDA approved. And it can successfully um, reduce the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans in the urine and have varying um, effects on disease burden, but it does not necessarily treat the cognitive effects or the cognitive impacts of the disease. So that's an unmet need still. Um, in certain cases, if we diagnose MPS1 early, before age two, there is some success with hematopoietic bone marrow transplantation. And the rationale there is that donor cells are then engrafted in the bone marrow, migrate to the brain, and therefore secrete the uh, alpha-L-iduronidase enzyme hopefully cross-correcting. Um, however, this procedure is associated with a high morbidity and mortality, so it's a very risky procedure. There are some uh, good, decent outcomes if you can transplant before age two. It has not been routinely shown or recommended for the other MPS disorders. For MPS4A and MPS6, I group them together because historically, um, they are more, uh, they're the enzymes involved in each of those disorders lead to a multi-systemic presentation without cognitive impact. There is no variability in that, in those two groups. So MPS4A, also known as Morchio A, and MPS4B, Morchio B, MPS6, also known as Maritolum A, there are three distinct enzyme deficiencies leading to gag accumulation, 
Uh, but intellectual disability developmental delay is not part of that phenotype, and that's an important distinction. And for both MPS4A and MPS6, there are FDA-approved therapies. Uh, again, these are enzyme replacement therapies that are administered intravenously weekly for the rest of their lives. Uh, for MPS4A, it's also known as Vimazin, and MPS6 is called Naglazyme. And these do treat the systemic manifestations, although there are limitations. Finally, um, the group that I left for last is MPS3. MPS3, or Sanfilippo syndrome, is actually four distinct enzyme deficiencies, and they're classified as MPS3A, 3B, 3C, and 3D. And we um, state typically they're more neuronopathic forms of the MPS with less systemic disease involved. Their burden is the cognitive impairment and behavioral difficulties. And they might be underdiagnosed because they might have uh, normal growth in early childhood and they might have some coarse features but it might not be picked up. And so they'll be referred to a neurologist for developmental delay, um, hyperactivity, impulsivity, ADHD, attention deficit. And so it needs to be on the radar for pediatric neurologists and developmental pediatricians, as well as the general pediatrician, to screen for mucopolysaccharidoses in this cohort of patients presenting with uh, either delay, developmental delay and or behavioral difficulties because their other MPS features might not be as prominent as we see in MPS 1 and 2, 4A, 6, and 7.